Uh, I'm very pleased to be moderating this session. My name is Alison Krentel. Uh, I'm based here in Ottawa with the Briar Research Institute in University of Ottawa. And I'm very pleased to um, have this amazing panel to introduce to you today. Uh, Dr. Anna Banerjee, who we met yesterday, who's the Director of Global Indigenous Health uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Margot Greenwood, um, an Indigenous scholar of Cree ancestry, um, who we heard from yesterday with more than 25 years experiencing experience focusing on the health and well-being of Indigenous children and families. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce you uh, to Jamie Medicine Crane, uh, who's an activist, advocate, and educator, and artist. Uh, and she's coming to us today as someone who has um, promoted indigenous rights, women's rights, human rights, and justice. Um, so before we begin today, um, uh, I must acknowledge that we are having this conversation on traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishabi people. Uh, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be here today um, to discuss some of the critical health issues that we're facing. Um, before we start, I need to acknowledge my own professional background. I'm a social scientist who's worked in global health for the last 20 years. And my work with indigenous communities has been in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Um, among other places, um, where I have listened to communities to ensure that we design health programs that respond to their needs and expectations. Um, by understanding how communities frame their own health, ill health, and the origins of disease, we can create acceptable programs, increase agency, and promote messages that encourage healthy behavior. In my role as a researcher, I must open my eyes and my ears and close my mouth, something that academics don't always do very well, and I will soon close my mouth. <laughs> um, I must listen to experts, um, and these experts are the community members themselves. Uh, in research conducted in Ghana by a woman called Polina Tindana, a village elder remarked that there is a saying that a stranger has eyes, but he cannot see. I have often been that stranger, and I am one that needs guidance, explanation, and advice to understand the communities where I work. I consider it an honor to learn from these communities, and today I find myself listening and learning again. Although I've worked in many different parts of the world, throughout my own research career, I have not had the privilege of working with indigenous peoples here in Canada. So today I will be listening and learning from our amazing panel, like you will be. Um, so I think before I, I, we begin, I would like to introduce Jamie, who's going to play an honor song for us to begin our session. Thank you. Hello, all my relations. My name is Jamie Medicine Crane. Uh, my traditional name is Brave Woman, and it was given to me by my late great auntie, Dr. Helen Manyfingers, um, who advocated a lot about um, indigenous rights, and um, she kind of, kind of one of my mentors and role models. Um, but today I'm going to um, acknowledge the traditional territory of the unceded um, Algonquin territory um, here that we stand on, that we do this most important work that affects all our people, not just here in the room, but around the globe. And um, I guess this, this honor song is so that we could continue this conference, uh, so that we continue to help our people at all levels, uh, professionally and um, empathetically. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that um, as people we need to learn um, when we grow um, elders have shared that with me um, in many many travels that I've had the blessing to uh, so this honor song is for all of those people in our communities that are that are sick uh, all those people that need healing um, there's multiple levels of healing 
uh, from traumatization to, to being just your body sick, um, and also to, to all of your families, um, so that if you're going through mourning or if you're going through any, any losses or you just need, need some positive energy, this honor song is for all of you, but also so that all of you get home safely to your home fires and that you can continue this work that we are, we are talking about here at this conference. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, I th in our session today, um, we're going to hear from Jamie, uh, who will start us off with her perspective on how colonization has infected, uh, affected Indigenous women and girls' health, and in turn, the health of the community. And then we'll hear from Dr. Anna Banerjee, who will share her research and experience working with Indigenous children, and highlight some of the inequities that these children face. Um, Dr. Greenman will then kind of bring it home for us, uh, talking about cultural safety as a strategy to address racism and inequity in our health systems. Um, so I think you'll agree with me that we have an excellent panel ahead of us. Um, so I would invite you to, um, either you can feel free to stand there or stand up there for your remarks. I'll just sit. Okay, perfect. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote um, that I heard from an uh, Indigenous writer named Thomas King. Uh, the truth about stories is that's all we are. And so when we look at the story about, um, about Canada and about the history, I'm going to share a story with you um, that took place a few hundred years before and prior to Confederation of Canada. Um, we are all in Europe. A strange and new exotic world has been discovered where a man can be a man. He's an adventurer, an explorer, the king of the wild frontier, and in this story, travel and exploration is the man's face and undiscovered and unknown lands are the woman's face. These are the homes of Indian princesses, chilling out in the meadows, um, dancing, in the, dancing in the trees, or warrior women with spears riding exotic animals. And they're ready for exploration, and so is this land. In this story, the land has become a woman who is there for the taking. We hear this story more, more than too often, such as Pocahontas and Avatar. We all have heard this version of a story. And for us as indigenous people, our women are connected to the land. We believe that whatever happens to the earth is directly impacted to us as women, because as women, we are water protectors, we're fire keepers, we're caregivers, and we're life givers, and so much more. And so when I look at the history of what has happened to 
to the thinking of the, the new explorers and settlers coming onto this land. A lot of our, our traditions and a lot of our ways of, of being, our, our communities were very matriarchal. But upon, the, upon contact, a lot of that changed. A lot of, um, a lot of our ways of being changed, our ways of doing things. And it was because of policies and different events that have affected us directly as Indigenous people and as Indigenous women and girls. See, in our, in our communities, our women are upheld with the most, utmost respect. And at one time, we were, we were treated as equal. As I sit here, um, I think about, um, I sit on the world board for World YWCA, and as I sit here, here in um, Canada, um, next year um, will be 150 years that the YWCA has been active in, in this country. Um, but I think about it, before that 150 years and before Confederation, our women were, were treated as, as equals, and our women were treated with so much respect because we, we provide so much. We're the backbone of our society. Without, without women, we wouldn't be able to survive in, in, in society because they're the, they're the life givers. And I guess the reason why I'm bringing this all up be, is because right from the beginning of colonization, our people have been faced with multi-level um, facets of racism. And not just from, from our women being discriminated as being a woman, but also um, the way that we did things. Our, our traditional ways of knowing, the way we take care of our people, our traditional knowledge of how to take plants and, and to use them at, as a way of healing. But not just that, the way that our community comes together and when we think of racism, our immediate understanding is personally mediated racism. We could see the interpersonal um, re connections that people have. And when, like for myself, I grew up in southern Alberta, and I came and I come from the Blackfoot people, a very proud member of, um, of the Blackfoot. I come from two tribes of four that make up the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai and Bigani. And with that, racism has always been in my face. As, as young as grade two, I, I faced racism. And that's only like six years old. Uh, people came, to, I, okay, let me tell you the story. Um, I was actually waiting for my bus after school. And as I was waiting, a group of um, non-Indigenous young women came from the high school, and they started picking on a couple of my friends and myself. And they started calling us names like wagon burner, uh, squaw. And at that age, I did not know what these these names meant. So I went back to my I went back home and I, I knew that they were bad because of the way that they were treating me. But they didn't just stop there with the names. They started trying to push my friends and I around. Um, they grabbed one of my friends and held her on the ground. And, so, and there was no teachers in sight. And, and as, we, as, as, as the kerfuffle continued, um, I guess, I ended up jumping on one of the girls and telling her, leave my friend alone. And just then, a teacher came, and the girls seen the teacher coming, and they ran away. And they told me, go back to your home. You do not belong here. But as far as I, I've learned the history that my parents and my ancestors and my grandparents have taught me is that our people have been here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the theories that say that we're, we haven't been um, are just starting to be prove, proven wrong. When they start finding, they found a bone um, that was predated 70,000 years old on my reserve. 
and it was a tool that, that we used as, as indigenous people. So to say that our people haven't been here for thousands and thousands of years, I feel that um, it's a disrespect. But I think that the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it happens everywhere. It doesn't just happen um, uh, in the streets. It happens in our health care. Um, it happens in education. It happens in our justice system. It happens everywhere. And when I think about it, I think about my, my cousin who passed away up, <clears throat> excuse me, about a few winters ago. And as, as he passed away, he was in the hospital. And, and he, he went to the hospital and he was doing really bad. And as he walked into the hospital, the healthcare professional said, are you drunk? And that's the most reaction that we always get. Even my mother went through that. She, w she had pneumonia, ammonia, and she went to the hospital and they wouldn't serve her. For almost an hour, they wouldn't serve her. She was sitting in, um, in the waiting room, almost like healing over, and they wouldn't do anything for her. And they just said, well, maybe you're on, you're on drugs. And these are things that happen in everyday life as an indigenous person. And we might not see it um, directly like that, but sometimes it's subtle. And sometimes it, it um, impacts us so much. You think about like all the things that our indigenous people that have been through, through, um, through residential schools where the, um, where the nourishment was so low that they couldn't get that proper nourishment. People were past, kids were passing away because they didn't have the proper food. And then when they put us on reserves, they said, you aren't allowed to hunt. You're not allowed to leave your, your lands. Um, you're not allowed to farm. Um, these are things that you cannot do. And if you do, then there's going to be, um, there's going to be, um, I guess, there's going to be those impacts to, to not only you, but to your family. And when we think about that, and we think about like how, how the history of Canada has treated our indigenous people, and the multiple ways that the reason why there's such a big gap in our health system is because there are some, there's, there's so many forms of different layers of racism and, and to take care of our ways, and also to also acknowledge some of our traditional knowledge systems that allow us to heal our people. And so when we look at, the, when we look at all these different racisms, the epistemology, epistemological racism, the institutional racism, all these different layers of racism, we look at how it's directly impacted on our people. And I think about how um, epistemology racism is the racism that centers around the idea of one group or people being inherently superior to another group of people and then using its power to maintain a societal position of advantage, access, and control focuses on the belief in knowledge. And when I think about that, and I think about some of our communities that are, are so high in poverty, you think about all the, all the reasons why our people are suffering with high, the highest rates of diabetes, the highest rates of suicide, the highest rates of STIs, and you think about how unequal our systems are. Um, it, it's that whole epistemological racism that people don't fully see. Because I think when I was doing my masters, one of the things that I that I knew, but I also learned, is that we all come into this world with biases. And sometimes we don't see those biases. And it's for us as human beings to start recognizing what those pieces are and recognizing how we can get past that, those different parts of the racism. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People um, 
states that we have the right to define the knowledge, Western traditional or our traditional knowledge in order to help us heal. And when I look at that, um, and I look at the healthcare system and, and also like myself, I've been learning, I, I've had the wonderful honor and opportunity to work with one of my elders and I'm still working, I'm still like in my beginning stages, but learning about those healing methods through plants and learning about those and how we could help. But when you, when you go to, um, when you go to some, some uh, doctors, sometimes um, the reaction about those traditional medicines are, um, are not even looked at. So having those opportunities to be able to, to use our traditional methods, but also to use the Western methods as well to help healing, um, I think that that's up to our people if that's something that, that we want to go through. Um, when, I, when I look at um, a, lot of, a lot of these things, I think about the, the coexistence of the Western healthcare with Indigenous knowledge and the outcomes that the women themselves, uh, valuable strengths, pride voice, uh, become cleaner in reducing harms of substance. When we, we look at our traditional ways and we look at um, going through ceremony or doing um, different ways of healing, there, there's advantages to this compared to the Western system where when you go into the hospital, sometimes as an Indigenous person, you're not taken as a first class citizen, you're always taken at as, as another like as another option and you're less than. And that comes back to like the whole perspective of of the beginning of colonization when people have when people started coming here and the way that they started seeing indigenous people as less than and continue to and it has morphed over time. And we see that through all our stats that we deal with. Um, we have over 5,000 murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls and men in, our, in this country. Uh, in this country that we, we call a peacekeeping country. And people around the globe don't even realize that that's how our women are treated. And that's how they are, they're just not even looked at as as important um, and and I think about the whole thing about feminism and the whole thing about coming to this country the reason why the women came to this country um, the the settlers came to this country was because they thought they could help save our women and when, when I think about that it was because for hundreds and hundreds of years women uh, over the over the ocean were fighting for that already because of what um, the view of women were the women and children were a part of the material for men and when we come over to this country and they came thinking that they could help save our women in ways it does in today's society because it helps us get our voice. But when I think about the whole way our patriarchal system was created in this country, it really takes away from that strength of women, the resilience of women, and how we as women have a large impact to our society. Um, and if we, if we don't have um, those pieces, I think that Indigenous self-determination um, is not going to happen. And the whole thing about taking, taking care of ourselves and taking care of our entire bodies, um, it's that holistic way of thinking, looking at our emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual being, and looking at that balance and how can we balance that. Because um, I think that as we, we balance our society by taking care of our women, um, some of those pieces will start to slowly fall into place. Um, I, guess, I guess for me, I feel that one of the biggest gaps um, in looking at this is, is that relationship. So when we look at reconciliation and we look at the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous, the whole thing that I've learned from elders is that 
we need to start listening to each other. We need to start understanding that there is a story here before um, 1000 AD when the first uh, contact was with the Vikings. Before that, there's no record because if you don't realize it, that the timeline is based on a Christian calendar. And as us, as Indigenous people, we didn't base our times on, on Christian calendars. So that time in memorial, we have times where we share different knowledges in a different way, and even to be able to record that. Um, like for the Blackfoot people, we have winter counts. And in every, every winter, we would find one specific event that, that targeted that and it would go um, every year and it would spiral out as, as pictographs would be created to, to signify that specific event. Um, and I look at that and I look at the history of, of our people and I see how beautiful our people are and I see how resilient we are and how, how strong we are. But at the same time, in today's world, there's a lot of sicknesses that we didn't have back then. And so what can we do as communities uh, to, to get rid of that, to get rid of that gap, to start understanding? And I think it goes back to that whole relationship piece. We need to start looking at how we treat others, how we treat each other, how we treat our indigenous people. Because there's so many events that has happened that, you know, like for example, Tina Fontaine, she, she was a product of the child and family welfare system. And when, she, when, she, when they found her, her body was in a bag and it was thrown into the river. And her, her murderer didn't even, um, he got acquitted. You know, and so th those are different elements of, of racism that continue to face us. For myself, I've been directly impacted by murdered and missing Indigenous women, not just um, advocating it for my whole life, but my first, my first interaction, and I didn't even know, but when I was three years old, my cousin went missing. And as she went missing, um, we couldn't find her. The police came back and they told us that um, she, she had passed away, that she choked on her vomit, and that's how she passed away. Later on, they found out that she was part of a serial killer that went across the nation killing just Indigenous women. And they wrote a book about it called Just Another Indian. Because that sometimes, that's the, that's the reality. That's how people see us, that, oh, just another Indian. We can just pass on. There's more of them. But in reality, you know, I think that it, as human beings, we need to start thinking and challenging those systems, challenging those ways of thinking. OK, I, I'm getting the. <laughs> um, and I guess one, one other thing that I wanted to share with you is that, like, for myself, that was just one, one example. But my um, most recently, about three, Four years ago, my niece and nephew were murdered, um, and and it, it co continues, right? So after they they were murdered, about two months later, my my cousin was also murdered from her partner. About three months later, um, my my cousin said. They, the police said that she committed suicide, but our family thinks differently. And so the story goes on. A year later, my, my other cousin got, went missing. We couldn't find her. And as we, as we looked for her, we, we couldn't find her. The police came back to us, and they came back to my cousin and said, you need to, you need to come and identify this body. When they went to go check the body, they only found her, they only found her head. The murderer had cut her up into hundreds of pieces and put her body into dump all over the city. And he, he only got 17 months because he said that he didn't murder her, but he was the drug dealer. So all these things add up 
And if you think about all of those things, it directly impacts our mental health. But if you think about those four elements that I talked about, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual, they're all connected. And if we're unbalanced in one of the other ways, it affects our health in all, all ways. And so I think that a lot of our communities, we need, we need to start having that empathy. We need to start having that understanding. And one of the biggest things is we need to start listening and start building those relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Um, and I, I just want to highlight a couple of important points that you mentioned. Um, uh, you've really highlighted the effect of racism and, and your family, through your own family story, uh, what, that, what ha that has actually meant. Um, so I think we'll, I won't speak anymore. I'll let uh, Anne come up. Well, thank you for inviting me back again today. Um, so I'm an infectious tropical disease specialist, and I see refugees in Canada. I've traveled to over 50 countries. I've done a lot of uh, development work, but I've spent probably most of the past 20 five years uh, researching in the Arctic. Try to explain that to my mother, a tropical disease specialist who spends all her time in the Arctic. Anyway, um, she's still trying to understand. Um, I could come up here and talk about the terrible statistics for Indigenous children, how they disproportionately suffer in every measurable category um, by those statistics. But I've decided to tell you my personal story instead. And then I'll throw in a few editorial comments and a few statistics. Um, since my childhood, my career was supposed to be working with vulnerable populations in resource poor parts of the world. But it took a sharp turn in 1995 when I was asked to go to Iqaluit, Nunavut, for a six-week pediatric research rotation. What I saw shocked me. I witnessed the poor determinants of health, extreme poverty, overcrowding, inaccessibility to services that we all take for granted. And I felt many of those health issues were comparable to what we see in resource-poor parts of the world. However, this was in our own backyard. When I worked at the hospital that summer, I, exclusively, I saw almost exclusively young Inuit babies admitted for lower respiratory tract infections, LRTIs. We call it bronchiolitis. Um, we'll get my slides up in the next little while. Um, OK, great. OK, oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure I would get them. All right. Um, so, so I would see all these little babies with, you know, terrible lung infections, usually caused by a virus, and I started wondering, is this real? How come they're so sick? This seems disproportionate. So I started out adding up the numbers, and that was the beginning of 20 years of research in Indigenous populations. Um, in my first study, I found out that one third of all the babies on Baffin Island were admitted to the hospital with the LRTI in the first year of life. But this rises to almost 50% if you're less than six months of age. And I've found out that Inuit babies get hospitalized at 30 to 60 times the Canadian average. The virus responsible for most of the admissions is something called RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. How many of you know about this or know about the story? How many of you have heard me talk about this before? OK, so yes, some of you. Okay. So these are the highest rates of admission for any demographic group in Canada. You know, why doesn't the general public know? We know about heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, et cetera. But when a third of the babies on Baffin Island end up in the hospital with a lung infection, this is the highest rate of any admission in any age group anywhere in the country. But very few people know about it, unless you've heard me talk about it. So we published papers which demonstrated that Inuit babies have the highest rates of RSV actually in the world. These rates are higher than Sub-Saharan Africa, India, or Asia. When these babies get admitted to the hospital, they have about a 13% chance of being put on life support, being medically air evacuated to a tertiary center, maybe Ottawa, Montreal, Edmonton, Winnipeg, across the country. They're separated from their families. Often they have prolonged hospitalizations in the intensive care unit often have complications and sometimes die. 
Our study in 2002 showed that one in 20 babies born on Baffin Island who was less than six months of age during the RSV season was put on, um, put on life support due to RSV. So if we think about that for a moment, one in 20 babies born in the RSV season in Ottawa, like just say the winter season, ending up in the hospital. You could fill up the TD, uh, TD place with babies that are intubated and put on life support, or fill up Rogers Stadium in Toronto. Why don't people know about this? In 2002, an antibody became available against RSV, but it's expensive, so it's restricted to the children at highest risk for, for um, um, RSV disease. And here we have a slide. So you've got one, all some different populations. You've got the rate of admission. You've got something called the number needed to treat. So basically, if you have any kind of intervention, you want to target the population with the highest rate of admission. And you want to, uh, number needed to treat is how many people do you need to treat before you actually have an in, in, uh, you make an intervention. For example, it could be for diabetes or, or anything, cancer treatment. So the lower the number, the better. The highest rate of admission should be the one that's targeted. Uh, so in this group of people, which group should get whatever uh, intervention? It's not a trick question. It's, it's pretty basic. Anyone daring to answer that question? Yeah. F, OK. So F has a rate of 328 versus 46 versus 81, and the lowest number needed to treat. Oops, okay, how do I go? Okay, so what we've realized is that, you know, groups, uh, you know, the, the RSV vaccine that came out in 2002, it's, it's given to the highest risk groups. So A to E are babies with uh, prematurity or chronic lung disease or heart disease, and those are their rates, and that's the number needed to treat. The bottom part are Inuit babies. So everyone from uh, A to E, they all get the RSV antibody, but F doesn't. We have science, we have statistics. Does anyone see a discrepancy here? So, so we have uh, babies uh, that have the highest rate of RSV admission in the world. They have very severe disease. We have a vaccine preventable disease where the implementation of the RSV antibody would be cheaper than the cost of admission, but it's still not implemented. Oh yeah, I forgot. Oh, this is one of my editorial comments. By the way, they happen to be Inuit. And I can tell you that that would never occur in any other population in Canada. And I stand before you as a witness of the discrimination that goes on with Indigenous peoples in Canada. And that the RSV story is only one example of the numerous examples of discrimination that occurs in our healthcare system. Whether it's diabetes, uh, cancer, anything else, this is just the tip of the iceberg. That's my first part, it's like three parts. So 20 years ago, I had heard some heartbreaking stories of a child being found uh, in the snow and in, in, in their diapers at minus 40 and the lack of social services in Nunavut, specifically in Inuit. After a long discussion with an Inuit elder, I happened to mention that I would be willing to adopt an Inuit child. Many years later, on December the 28th, 2004, I know that day because that's when I was called by the Canadian Red Cross to go to the tsunami in Asia. Um, I received a phone call saying that there was an Inuit child uh, in a foster home that needed, needed to be adopted, or they were looking for a home. And that the elder happened to mention, Dr. Bio has said she would adopt an Inuit child. So I canceled my trip to Asia and flew up to Iqaluit to adopt my son. I said yes before I knew if he, if he was a he or she, or what age they were, I just said yes. Actually, I'd never even seen my son or a picture of him until they put him in my arms and said, this is your child. So I've been taking my son back to the north every two to three years so he could know about his identity and see his foster and biological families. And through my time in the Arctic, I saw that many Inuit communities live in substandard housing with severe overcrowding, and I have stayed in some of these homes. On our last trip, I took my 11-year-old son back to his home community, where I went to the grave of his 14-year-old brother who had committed suicide. This is another editorial comment. 
By the way, the rates of suicide are astronomically higher than the rest of Canada. I believe that Inuit children or Inuit youth have the highest rates of suicide in the world, and that often First Nations and Inuit families, sorry, First Nations and Inuit youth have packs to kill themselves, and they kill themselves together in epidemics. Going back to the story. My son realized that his family members had addictions. Again, editorial comment. The impact of colonization has long-lasting impacts on some Indigenous people and some communities. He realized that his brothers and sisters were malnourished. Again, editorial comment. In fact, they are stunted. By the way, 70% of preschool children in Nunavut have food insecurity. And the cost of food in, in the Arctic for many Inuit families is unaffordable. We have Indigenous children starving in this country. The impact, the impact of colonization has had a direct impact on my son's mental health, where he suffers from depression. And now, as a 13-year-old boy, he talks about suicide as if it's a norm or an option for him. As a non-Indigenous woman, the legacy of colonization has had a personal impact on my family as well. I've also been part of the First Nations Inuit Métis Committee of the Canadian Pediatric Society and have had the privilege to travel across the country to, many, to numerous Indigenous communities, from Haida Gwaii to Nain, rural and urban. I've written a statement on behalf of the Canadian Pediatric Society for the injury prevention of Indigenous children uh, and youth in Canada. And through writing the statement, okay, uh, I realized that Indigenous children uh, at, die at three to four times the, the national average. And for the ones that have serious injury, most of them don't have access to rehab. And that many indigenous homes don't have fire alarms or fire stations or smoke detectors or, or swimming lessons or personal, personal flotation devices or anything that we take for, for granted for, uh, for injury prevention. I've also written a paper on food security, hopefully it'll be published in the next little while, where again I say that Indigenous children are starving in this country. You know, we looked at the facts. This is not just me saying it. These are facts. It should be a national embarrassment. I have heard communities talk in despair about the opioid addictions and the loss of their youth. I've traveled to communities in Labrador and, and have heard about the despair, about the epidemics of fetal alcohol syndrome. And I've also been to Haida Gwaii, which is among one of the healthiest communities I've seen because they have food security from the fish and marine animals, which is now threatened. I am a pediatrician, researcher, mother, and I am now a witness. Indigenous children in Canada do not have equitable access to the basic necessities of life compared to non-Indigenous children in Canada. We can only move forward as a society when the most vulnerable populations in our society have equity in the social determinants of health. Yeah, I'm going to put a plug in again for the conference because if you want to learn about Indigenous health solutions, there are many solutions if you start listening. But this is one of the things where you can hear more uh, from the voices of Indigenous people uh, who talk about uh, some of the challenges and some of the solutions over a three-day period in a conference, the Indigenous Health Conference, Walking Together. There are some more uh, pamphlets here. There are many so solutions, but if we as a society put in a real effort and truly believe that we can, this is important and we need to move forward, then we can truly leave no people behind. Thank you. Well thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Uh, just while Margot's coming up, thank you. Come on up. We're highlighting um, some of the inequities of access to vaccines um, and your own personal experiences. Um, I think you've, the stories that we've heard are very personal and they're very real and they help for us to, to really see, they put a face on, on some of the numbers that we've been talking about. So I appreciate both of you being willing to share your stories. And now uh, I'll turn over to Margo. And you know. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me begin by acknowledging the unceded traditional territories and ancestors of the Algonquin people and, and thank them for allowing me to be here again today on their territory to engage in this conversation with you, uh, miigwech. Um, <clears throat> I want to begin by saying miigwech to Jamie for your opening our session in a good way. Um, it's always important that we do that wherever we're at. 
And thank you for your stories, uh, your deeply personal stories, and your comments about our history. Um, and I don't think they're far off for many of our peoples across Turtle Island. And Anna, thank you for your commitment, commitment to our children. Um, it really is quite remarkable. Thank you for that. I am going to talk a bit about the determinants of health. Um, I, in one of my other roles, um, besides what you've heard uh, in my introduction, I'm the Vice President of Indigenous Health for the Northern Health Authority in Northern British Columbia. So that covers the upper two thirds of British Columbia. And so um, in that role, I work very directly in the healthcare system. And we have lots to learn. Um, I will say that. And I think there is a lot of committed people who are wanting to do that learning. But this morning, uh, before I get into that more fully, I was um, reading the Globe and Mail this morning and reading about the pipeline. Uh, <laughs> that's a big, uh, big issue for all of us. And um, I know that, um, you know, uh, provinces have their stand, the federal government has their stand and so do First Nations people. And um, so I ran into a, a gentleman from Haida Gwaii, one of the leaders at, um, from there, and he was in Ottawa. And um, I said, so what do you think about all of this? And he said to me, you know, we have to learn to live in relationship with each other. So when I think about this and the stories that we hear, uh, those relationships have not always been positive. But I'm really interested in how do we change those relationships and how can we live in better balance and in harmony with each other. And you know, uh, the world is far too small now not to think about it as a global community. Um, people are moving across boundaries all the time. And so how do we live in harmony? How do we teach those people that come to these shores of Turtle Island about our history? We have to speak to that. As Indigenous people, we have to tell our stories and we have to tell our histories. And I think there's multiple players that have a role in that. I think government have a, has a role. Society has a role. We as Indigenous people have a role. And all of the segments within that have roles to play. It's our responsibility as humanity to understand how we will be in relationship. Instead of universality, it is the richness and the power of diversity. Let us embrace that instead of trying to have one number or one stat that's gonna represent all of us, let us look to the nuances and to the richness because really, that's where the innovation is. That's where our realities are in all of our communities. So I wanna talk a bit about determinants of health and I'm gonna go very quickly because I know we don't have very much time and I want you to be able to engage in this conversation and ask the kinds of questions that you would like to ask. So I'm just going to, I've got four slides I'm going to share and I'm gonna be like skipping on the top of a pond here because I think uh, a lot of you will know what I'm already talking about anyway. So uh, can you, are they up? No, nope. here they are. So. <clears throat> One of the things in the world that I live in, I live in the world of public health as well as the health authority, and the determinants of health are really important to Indigenous people. And the 2009 WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health led by Sir Michael Marmot was really important to us and I think one of the reasons that it was really important was the fact that it reveals inequities. That whole approach um, is really about revealing those inequities, revealing those nuances underneath. So Michael Marmot always talks about the causes of the causes. So if we're ill, what's causing that? And it's really about all of the factors that impact our lives. It isn't just about whether we have 
um, well, it certainly is about it, but you know, it isn't just singularly where that we have food or shelter or all of those things. It's all of the things that impact us. And we just heard how racism can impact our well-being. Um, and so it was really exciting for us to, to engage in this, I think, because it's a more holistic perspective of looking at our, our health and well-being. And one of the uh, phrases that I now hear uh, from Indigenous people is around the causes of the causes of the causes. So that first cause is all about the colonial experience that happened and continues to play out in our realities. And so when you're um, in our communities, you're going to hear, if you're talking with people, you're going to hear that causes of the causes of the causes. Because we cannot address health and well-being without looking at the, um, the historical context in which we find ourselves. We cannot leave that behind. There are some unique determinants of health that are specific to Indigenous people, and so we have some of these here. Colonization. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about residential schools and their impacts. We heard a bit about that this morning, or this afternoon, rather. Colonialism and multiple forms of discrimination. Self-determination. How self-determining are we as nations on our own lands? And there's been some studies around that and youth suicide that show the more self-determining we are, the, the, um, the healthier we are. Language and culture, indigeneity. I want to talk, just say one thing about microaggressions, and it's, it's, a, it's very subtle. I remember I was in high school, and somebody said to me, well, you don't look like an Indian, Margo. And I'm thinking, oh, so what's that supposed to look like? Please tell me. Or you go into shops somewhere, and they follow you around because they think you're going to steal. I mean, it's just, it's not said, but it's right there in your face, right? So there's a lot of subtle things. I lived in a place where on one side of the street, literally, on one side of the street there was street lamps and, and a paved road, and on the other side of that street there were no street lamps and it was a dirt road. And all that separated it was the width of one street. And it's because that was the reserve community and this was the city. Like, how does it get more blatant than that, right? Fascinating to me. This is a model of uh, the determinants of health that we use. I'm not going to go through it because I don't have time. But you can see one of the most important pieces about this, though, is that beige circle that says interfaces. And really, it's acknowledging that there are different knowledge systems in the world. There's not a single knowledge system. That's why we have different cultures, because we have, all have our own knowledge systems. And so it really looks at how do those other systems interface and interact. I'm really interested in the interface of that, because that's where relationality is, and that's really important. The last slide that I have really talks about how do we get to change. And it is, um, and I wanted to talk a bit about what we've done in the uh, Northern Health in partnership with the First Nations Health Authority in the province of British Columbia to begin to address um, racism and discrimination. And a part of that has been, um, there's a couple things that have happened at the structural level there. We had the signing of the Transformative Change Accord which was a tripartite. So provincial, federal, and First Nations governments came together and said, we, we are going to be in a new relationship in health. And so they made a commitment. So that's an example of that. At the systemic change level, there was a declaration recently signed on cultural safety and humility. So culturally safe services. And that was signed by all of the CEOs in the health authorities and now other professional organizations such as nurses, doctors, teachers across the province are committing to cultural safe practice. So whatever sector that is. And then at the practice level, so that's at a systems level. And we also see change in the health authority in the creation of positions so we now have a vice president, indigenous health, within a health authority, which is brand new. Ask health authorities across the country how many have a VP, indigenous health. 
not very many, if any. At the practice level is where the interactions between health practitioners and the person from our communities coming in. They're putting the lights out for me, are they? Say, Cut! <laughs> I'll be very quickly. Um, it is um, really important uh, that the practice, that's where we hear these exper personal experiences of racism happen in those places. It's where the individuals come in. So those systems and structures enable good practice to occur. And that's what should be happening. Now I have a DV, uh, video to show you as a tool. It's four minutes. It's a tool that we created at Northern Health to address, um, to inform our 8,000 employees to be the very best practitioners they can be. So I want to share that. Can you cue that up? Indigenous peoples thrived on the lands of present-day Canada for thousands of years. About 500 years ago, Europeans began to arrive. By the 1900s, an explicit colonial agenda to control and assimilate Indigenous peoples was in place. The impacts of this are still felt today and show up as a larger burden of ill health, loss of language and culture, dislocation and marginalization. This history is part of Canada and we all share a responsibility for healing relationships. How do we do this? Creating an environment of cultural safety in healthcare settings is one step toward healing this relationship. Cultural safety is achieved when people of diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds feel respected and safe from discrimination. At Northern Health, our values include empathy, respect, collaboration, and innovation. When we put these values in action, we strive to honor diversity, genuinely care, and build trust through understanding. Cultural safety grows when these values are applied to the context of cultural differences. How can we do this? By developing our cultural awareness, sensitivity, and competency through cultural humility. Let's take a look at the meaning of each of these terms. Cultural humility is a lifelong journey of self-evaluation, reflection, and learning to deepen our understanding of how our life experiences influence how we understand and interact with others. The skills of self-reflection and assessment carry us along a path of understanding and change. The journey often starts with cultural awareness recognizing that differences and similarities exist between cultures. Learning about the histories that impact Indigenous peoples in Canada is an important part of developing cultural awareness. Cultural sensitivity grows when we start to see the influences of our own culture and acknowledge that we have biases. This can be an eye-opening experience and it may take courage and humility to walk this path. Cultural sensitivity is not about treating everyone the same. With cultural awareness and sensitivity comes a responsibility to act respectfully. Cultural competency is about developing practical skills for interacting in respectful ways with people who are different from us. It's about reducing the number of assumptions we make about people based on our biases. Cultural competency does not require us to become experts in cultures different from our own. Cultural safety improves as we proceed along this path of self-reflection and learning. The goal of culturally safe healthcare is that people feel respected and safe from discrimination when they access health services. 
As healthcare practitioners and service providers, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to provide the best quality care possible to all individuals. And this involves developing our cultural competence through humility. Along this journey, we begin to understand and appreciate the gifts that each of us brings to the table. Together, we can work to ensure that everyone is able to maintain their dignity when they are seeking care and at their most vulnerable. We can, as individuals and as organizations, foster trusting and respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and communities. So our journey begins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margot, um, for your remarks. Thank you for highlighting the richness and the nuance that we need to be paying attention to and our responsibility uh, in, as humans to, um, to some of the issues that you've raised. Um, and also for sharing this very practical video um, uh, that demonstrates one of the ways forward uh, when we talk about how to uh, end the institutional racism that we've heard about firsthand um, from our panelists. I think you'll all agree that I probably have the worst job in the room because it's almost impossible to limit these amazing women and the stories that they've had to tell. And I feel incredibly uncomfortable um, to, to, but I also recognize that there will, some of you will want to, to have some remarks and questions for our panelists. So um, I really would like to open it up uh, if there's anyone that would I do have some questions, but I, I know that what we've heard about today has raised, um, has really, as I said earlier, and, it, and it's a quote from a man who was the director of CDC in the US, Bill Fahey, that we need to remember the faces of the people that we're talking about. And I think this morning, that's what, this afternoon rather, this is what we've seen. Um, so it's been very powerful for me to be a part of. And I thank you, each of you, for sharing um, your stories and, and also um, really raising some of these in incredible inequities that, that we see in Canada today. So I'd like to invite anyone to come forward right now. We only have about 10 minutes left, um, but I want to, to let you have a chance to, to, to ask some questions to our panelists um, uh, today. And we need to leave on time, <laughs> end on time. So yeah, and please introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Farah. I work for UNICEF Canada, and we'll, this will be more of a personal question or comment. Um, I've experienced racism myself for a long time, and when I saw this video, I was like, this can be used everywhere racism exists, right? So I was wondering if this is something you're doing already to do this outreach to the newcomers, to immigrants who come to Canada. The landscape of the communities within the country is no longer the same, and I was wondering this can help building the relationship. And by the way, thank you for your very powerful experiences and for sharing these with us. Thank you. Is that for me? I have a comment too. <clears throat> so um, I think you're right. The, this little DVD has, is, has gone national and international. It's being used in multiple sectors. And I think you point, um, I don't have any hard evidence on this, but I suspect that we need to be more helpful with people coming to Canada and giving them more information around the history, uh, especially Indigenous people. I mean, I think I could ask everybody in this room and say, ask you, did you learn about the historical realities of Indigenous people in the education system? And you would probably say, no, I know I didn't. I could name off all the explorers, but I, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I could not, I learned my history and my family and my community. And I think that's really important um, that all of us are, are sharing that, hi that similar history. And I think it's incumbent upon us to teach newcomers coming to Canada and to Turtle Island um, the history. Um, I interpret the question a little bit differently mm -hmm. to say, um, could we use this framework of cultural safety for other populations coming in, refugee populations mm -hmm. coming in the way we treat them? I, as someone who work, walks both 
worlds. They call me bipolar because I work <laughs> in the Arctic and in the tropics as well. Uh, and I work with refugees. Uh, there are very huge differences between uh, refugees and indigenous populations, although there's a lot of overlap with the poverty, um, uh, language, all, all kinds of barriers. The, the big difference that I see from the refugees that coming in is the oppressors uh, were places that they had left. And here in Canada, the oppression has really been the government and, and Canadian society. So I think that people always ask, why do we learn Indigenous health separate from Somali health or Syrian health or whoever? There are, there are really big uh, differences. And I think uh, a newcomer whose child is in school can go up to, grow up to be whatever because they have the same access to health care and education versus someone on a reserve has a lot more barriers in today's day. Um, so I'm not sure if that's the question you're asking, but anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Thompson. I work for the Canadian Red Cross and thank all of you very much for this panel. Um, I'm just thinking, um, Probably two years ago, we wouldn't have had a panel like this panel in CanWatch. So there's a shift going on in this sector. And I think, and that's like the international sector and also health. And so one of the things I'm thinking about as I'm listening to you is, is that you know most of us in this room work on a project program basis, right? Two years, three years, maybe five years, 10 if we're lucky. And then we come home and we do something else. <laughs> we go to another project and do that. So this is not, I mean, as the video says, this is a lifelong you know, journey. This is not a project-oriented thing that we're, we're entering. And so I'm just wondering if you could give some reflections on things that you think would help all of us as we, as we continue, you know, to integrate what we consider international health or whatever you want to call it with health in, in this country and where we look to find those commonalities and work together in that. Thank you. You guys want to start? You want me to start? <laughs> I hope I'm understanding your correct question correctly. Um, so you're looking for strategies to help you to understand uh, more about um, Indigenous people in Canada and how that resonates with your work outside of Canada? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Short term. No, maybe, maybe I, okay. I think no. It's more than that for me. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. You know, as because we have a panel like this now, this signifies to me a shift in this sector, right? Yes. So that's going to require us to shift our thinking. And as yes. I mean, as you know, plans working more in Canada. I mean, there are all the kinds of or international organizations that are now working in Canada with Indigenous populations. So I'm just thinking, we come from a, a, a sector in international that's project program oriented with a yes. time limited thing. But the issues that you're raising are not project program issues, right? There's, you know, a whole history beyond that. Yes. So I think as, like, I'm just trying to look for where are the points perhaps of meeting, right, in between those two sectors that are, well, actually it's this, in a sense the same sector. Where are the points of um, just, Unity, I think, in that. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Do you want to start now? Yeah. So, yeah. so um, I think that it is a lifelong learning and process of engagement, but there are communities out there that, that have certain projects in mind. They, there may be a community that says, okay, we really have an issue with, with this health issue. Uh, can you help us or can these researchers or can can someone else come in because we don't yet have the capacity to deal with this uh, short term not short term but like a, a strategy for smoking cessation how you work together but it's really has to come from the community saying this is the, what's really important to our community this is what we really would like to happen, can you work with us to try to build some kind of prog program that we can continue to have? So there are ways of doing short-term strategy in collaboration, in partnership with communities uh, based on what their needs are. I think it's also um, an individual change. Um, if you remember that graphic I had up there, there's uh, at the practical level, it's, it's really about individuals. So what is it that I know about the history of where I live? What do I know about the people that I am uh, serving? 
because really organizations serve others if there's a health challenge. So what do I know about those people and how do then how do I respect that? So for me at the practice at the individual level, it really gets down to um, the values and also um, knowing who I'm serving and who I'm serving. And I think those become transferable wherever these programs go. So that's at the individual level. I think it's incumbent on, upon us to know the history of where we come from. We always start with who are we? You all have a history in this room. You could all sit up here and tell the stories of your own history. So who am I in this context? And what do I need to know about those that I live with? So that's the individual piece, and that's transferable across. So if I was working in programs outside of Turtle Island, I'd be wondering, who are those people? What are the protocols? What are their histories? So that I may serve them in the best way possible that is respectful of them. And so I think that's a really important piece. I think organizationally is the same question. How do organizations challenge themselves to say, what is it that I need to know as an organization? Why am I doing this? How is it that I interface in a respectful way? You can ask the same thing at the organizational level. How is the policies and the ways that we do things in other countries or in this country with indigenous people, how is that respectful? Am I honoring them in my policy? And does that enable the workers on the ground to be the same way, to be respectful. And then, I mean, then you can look at the big structural pieces too, right? How do we fund people? You know, that's a really good one to look at. Is it respectful? Or do I make them report up on these things, these five criteria that has nothing to do with what's going on on the ground? And that's an organizational piece. And here's people implementing that, but it looks totally different. I know that happens, sorry, I know that happens in our communities. So we have to answer here because this is the requirement, but that's not really telling the story of what's happening here. So it's really frustrating with just singular numbers and those sorts of things. And I, I mean, I deal in the world of evidence and stats a lot. <laughs> so, you know, what's the narrative that goes with that? Um, so I hope that's a bit helpful to you. I think it always starts with ourselves. Where else can we go? We have to start here. This is my reality. This is my story. This is my history. How does it go with your story, your history, your protocols? How can I be in relationship with you in a respectful way? And, and by the same token, you respect me. I think those are, those are questions we always have to ask. And I think that goes when we're into policy, especially on the organizational level. It's really challenging. Individuals make the organizations. Thank you. So challenge the questions. Ask the questions. <laughs> so we just have like a minute left. So perhaps if you could frame Sorry. your comments, uh, your questions as brief comments. Uh, um, I think we're here. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I, I want to thank all the panelists. It was, a, it was a, quite an inspiring panel to listen to. Uh, my name's Heather Johnston. I work for an organization called Dignitas International. Um, we've been doing some work uh, up in uh, Sioux Lookout with the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority uh, for uh, seven or eight years now. Uh, to, I mean, a question, and Anna sort of partly seconds. answered this, is um, as an organization that came out of working in Africa and the Global South um, and has now for quite a while been working up north, uh, in northern Ontario, we, we struggled a little bit to define our role as what is our role as an NGO uh, working in these communities. And, and um, uh, as Margot said, it, it, it's, it's allowed us to really question um, how we work in general also in Africa. And, it, and I think it's changed how we've worked in Africa yeah. and some, with some of our partners. But I, that's the question I, I would put out is, and because I think probably a lot of people here sitting from organizations who work in the Global South and who are wondering what is our role, how do we engage with uh, indigenous communities here at home? You've done a, a, a fantastic job about talking about some of the, the, the inequalities and the inequities that, that communities are facing. But what is NGOs, what, how do we engage and, and, and what is our role, what can we be doing uh, 
uh, to support change coming to, to the communities where you live in and the health systems uh, where, where Indigenous people are being served. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to, we're just very briefly, and then yeah. I need to close <laughs> Okay. Off, right? um, my name is Ashley Chisholm from the Canadian Nurses Association, and my question slash comment is about um, healthcare provider racism. And often we see in Canada, um, I know in BC they're doing a phenomenal job, is that Indigenous health, cultural safety, are being taught in our um, health profession educational programs as a one-off lecture or a compressed unit. And my question is, that I want us to think about is, what can we do to keep Indigenous health and cultural safety on the top of minds of our healthcare providers at all times, not just during one specific class or those who are working specifically with Indigenous populations at all times? Thank you. That's a wonderful point. Um, oh, so you oh, join that, so there's no time. Are we, we're out. I think we're out of Can time. Can I just say something? Yes, I think, yes. I think that it's really important, no matter where you are, I think that it's all about that relationship piece. Um, answering that, the lady's question over here is that we, um, we need to really build that relationship with our Indigenous people in our communities and not think that we're going into, our com into the communities saving our people, mm -hmm. but really working with our communities to understand the traditional knowledge and protocols that they have in every community and know that they're diverse communities um, and understand that relationship and still and start to build that relationship because I think that if you think about any relationship that you build it takes that nurturing and caring and and that uh, watering of the seed to to really build that authentic relationship and I think that that's one of the most important things um, in any in any um, I guess system is to to really understand and to really build that relationship listen and respect thank you I think those are wonderful words to end on thank you very much